A Muslim recently asked me if I could provide one reason why Islam is false. No, I'm afraid I can't do that. It would be far too hard to limit myself to just one. Welcome back to Reasoned Answers. I normally focus on in-depth answers to theological questions, but today I have a milestone to celebrate. I recently released my 100th video, and to celebrate, I'm going to list 100 reasons why I believe Islam is false. Obviously, with 100 reasons to get through, I can't spend much time on each, lest we be here all night. But I will put the references on the screen and encourage you to verify the Islamic texts actually say what I claim. This isn't a countdown, but I've grouped things thematically, with the most devastating category coming last, so things will get meatier as we go. And yes, even with a hundred spots to fill, I did have to leave a lot of good stuff off the list. With all that out of the way, let's jump in. First up are self-serving revelation and special privileges a prophet receiving a revelation that benefits only him is a hallmark of cults. Sure, it doesn't prove revelation false, strictly speaking, but it sure is a big red flag. And Muhammad raised so many red flags, you'd think you were at a communist rally. The Quran, the book which claims to be guidance for all people in all ages, contains the utterly useless command to not overstay your welcome at Muhammad's dinner party because he's too shy to tell you himself. But thankfully, Allah isn't shy like that. After Muhammad got caught having sex with his slave girl, despite having numerous wives whom he supposedly visited all in the same night, he made a promise to his angry wives that he would stop. That is, until Allah rebuked him for making the oath. Muslim men are limited to four wives, but not Muhammad. He gets as many as he wants, thanks to a special decree of Allah. Speaking of Muhammad's wives, when two of them shared his secrets with each other, Allah revealed a threat, saying they could be replaced in his eternal word. And then there's Muhammad's wife, Sada. When she grew old, she feared Muhammad would divorce her. So she cut a deal, allowing Muhammad to spend more time with Aisha. Allah endorsed the deal by sending down Surah 4, 128. And just to be sure everyone knew it was okay, Allah added 3351 as well. And who can forget Zainab, the beautiful wife of Muhammad's adopted son? Or should I say ex-wife? After Muhammad saw her scantily clothed, he desired her. Zainab's husband, Zaid, offered to divorce her. But Muhammad said no. Then, mysteriously, Allah corrected him with the bizarre excuse that this was done to solve the non-existent problem of people wondering if it was lawful to marry their adopted sons, ex-wives. You might be getting the impression that it was all about women for Muhammad, and you wouldn't be alone in thinking that. Multiple hadith claim Muhammad loved women and perfume above all else, while well, at least one adds food as well. I don't know about you, but that sure sounds more like a hedonist than a prophet to me. Which brings us to our next category, the gross immorality of Muhammad. While immorality doesn't necessarily invalidate a claim to prophethood, it certainly invalidates the Islamic belief that Muhammad is the perfect example for all humanity to follow. Let's look at a few examples. After Muhammad and his small band of followers moved to Medina in 622, they faced a problem. Where were they going to get income from? Muhammad's solution? raiding unarmed trade caravans and taking their stuff. The plan proved successful, and Muhammad used the same basic model to spread Islam, 
promising war booty, or ganima, in exchange for fighting. War booty wasn't the only way Muhammad kept people in Islam, however, as he was not above bribery. And speaking of greed, a man named Kiana knew where a certain treasure was hidden. Muhammad wanted it. So he gave the order, torture him until you extract what he has. A fire was lit on Kiana's chest and eventually he was killed. Sadly, Muhammad never did learn where that treasure was. War booty wasn't the only thing Muhammad's soldiers got. When his men were apart from their wives and feeling horny, Muhammad said, Don't worry, you can have sex with all the captive women you want. Alternatively, soldiers were given the option of doing muta. That is, paying a woman for a brief marriage, or what anyone else would call prostitution. But wait! Didn't Muhammad elevate the status of women? Nah, apparently not. A woman was beat by her husband until her skin turned green, which caused Aisha, Muhammad's child bride, to remark, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. Muhammad's response? She deserved it for speaking ill of her husband. He also claimed women were deficient in religion and intelligence, by the way. When a follower killed a woman in front of her child for making fun of Muhammad, he declared that nothing wrong had occurred. Which is hardly surprising, since Muhammad ordered the execution of a hundred-year-old poet who mocked him, a slave girl who wrote satirical songs about him, and many other critics. Speaking of slaves, Muhammad bought, sold, and traded slaves, including black Africans, incidentally, as a form of currency. Muhammad even rebuked a man who freed six slaves at the time of his death and forced four of them back into slavery. And no discussion of Muhammad's immoral actions is complete without mentioning his favorite wife. At the ripe young age of 50, Muhammad married the six-year-old Aisha. But don't worry, he waited until she was nine to rape her. Yes, rape. A nine-year-old cannot possibly give informed consent for sex. Taking a step up, we go from immoral actions of Muhammad to immoral actions of his sock puppet god. As we've seen, Allah has space in his eternal word for Muhammad's dinner parties and commands for him to marry the ex-wife of his adopted son. But do you know what Allah didn't have space for? Any condemnation of rape. In fact, he encouraged it, giving men permission to have sex with the women their right hand possesses. That is, war captives and slaves, in addition to their four wives. But should we really be surprised? After all, Allah describes women as fields for their husbands to plow, when and how they please. Likewise, Muslim men are given permission to beat their wives if they merely fear disobedience. And how old are those wives? The Quran gives no minimum age, but makes it clear that prepubescent marriage is permitted. And lest there be any doubt about women's status in Islam, don't forget that men are promised big-breasted, eternally virgin hories in paradise. Women, of course, don't get any similar privilege. Enough on sex and sexism. Let's look at violence in the Quran. Muslims are commanded to fight Jews and Christians until they either convert or pay the jizya and feel themselves subjugated. In comparison to others, though, that's a privilege. Muslims are commanded to kill the polytheists wherever you find them. And why is that justified? Because disbelievers are the worst of all creatures. If that isn't bad enough, a Muslim is permitted to kill a child if it is feared the child will grow up to be a disbeliever. But only if all it makes one do it, of course. Which brings us to some deficiencies of Allah himself. 
It seems this sock puppet has a few holes in it. All it causes some people to obey and others to disobey. He does not grant anyone free will. Allah is not all loving. Indeed, he does not love the unbelievers, the wrongdoers, the wasteful, transgressors, the treacherous, or the arrogant. This is in spite of the fact that he was the one that caused these actions to begin with. Then, Allah just arbitrarily forgives whom he likes and punishes whom he likes. But that's not all. Allah will mercifully place the sins of Muslims on Jews and Christians on Judgment Day, and then presumably punish them accordingly. Indeed, human beings have no value in the sight of Allah. Some are created solely so Allah can make them go astray and then destroy them. That sure doesn't sound like a just God to me. In the Quran, Allah and his angels pray. The angels presumably pray to Allah, but who does he pray to? No one knows. Muslims try to claim the verse means send blessings, which just shifts the problem, making the angels gods. Allah calls himself the greatest of all deceivers, an ironically true statement. Allah makes that boast while tricking people into believing Jesus was crucified, thus creating the world's largest religion. But wait, Christians are destined to hell. So doesn't that mean all it caused billions to go to hell through his deceit? Up next are some reasons to doubt that Muhammad's prophethood came from God. The non-sock puppet one, that is. According to Islamic tradition, it all began when Muhammad was hanging out in a cave and had an encounter where he was squeezed by an unknown force until he thought he would die. That seems pretty demonic to me. And Muhammad agreed. His initial impression was that he was possessed by a jinn. Because of this, Muhammad tried to commit suicide. Later, when revelation stopped for a period, he again wanted to commit suicide. Later in his career, Muhammad was the victim of black magic that gave him delusional thoughts, a clear sign he was not protected from evil by God. Meanwhile, Muhammad made several prophecies which have proven false. For example, he predicted the imminent end of the world, saying a young boy then living would not be very old when the last hour came, and elsewhere saying that no one would be living a hundred years from then. And what about the odd death of Muhammad? In the Quran, Allah says that if Muhammad was giving false revelations, he would die by having his aorta cut. Then, as he was dying, Muhammad exclaimed, I feel as if my aorta is being cut! Kind of sounds like a deathbed confession to me. Muhammad stated that bells are the instruments of the devil. He also stated that his revelation came with the sound of a bell. Another admission of his own fraudulent claims, perhaps? Speaking of Satan, at one point Muhammad revealed verses supporting polytheism. He later claimed that he'd been tricked by Satan into doing so. Conveniently, this story, now known as the Satanic Verses, has been whitewashed from many later Muslim histories. Which brings us to the next set of reasons that Islam is false. Historical problems with the formation of Islam. In Islam, the deeper one dives, the shakier the history gets. The Satanic Verses incident is found in numerous texts, making it hard to deny historically. But attempts to wipe it from Islamic history reflect a common pattern. The earliest biographies of Muhammad have been lost. The earliest one extent to significant amount is that of Ibn Ishaq, more than a hundred years after the time of Muhammad. His work is preserved by Ibn Hassim, who edited it down and removed some of the controversial parts. This is not itself all that problematic. What is problematic is the work paints a very different, much more violent picture of Muhammad than Islam today claims. 
Muslims now reject Ibn Ishaq and instead rely on Hadith collections, which were compiled 200 or more years after Muhammad died. Historically speaking, this is a huge problem as the earliest sources are rejected in favor of later ones, which have had much more time to be sanitized. Muslim works aren't the only source of information, however, and several non-Muslim texts describing Muhammad predate the earliest Islamic texts. These paint another picture of Muhammad, seeing him as a combination of military leader and claimed prophet of Christianity, but never as the founder of a new religion. Then there is the Quran itself. It paints a picture of an end-times prophet who thought the world was about to end. Furthermore, the prophet seems to think he was sent only to the Arabs, not to all of humanity. That's four sources of possible information about Muhammad, and four different pictures painted, none of which match modern Muslim claims about Muhammad. What should we believe? The lack of extant trusted sources, other than the Quran, for Islam's first 200 years, combined with the differing pictures of Muhammad, is highly suspicious. It sure looks like legendary development, or even outright whitewashing and deception, occurred. Islam, as we know, requires the Hadith to be 100% true. But historically, that is simply not plausible. Speaking of whitewashed history, what's the deal with Mecca? Islamic tradition says it's the oldest city in the world, that it was a great trade capital before Muhammad's time. However, there's no concrete evidence, physical or documentary, that it even existed before the 7th century. Every mosque is supposed to point to Mecca, but when we look at the earliest ones, they seem to point instead to Petra. Mecca is mentioned only once in the Quran by name. The geography described is compatible with an Islamic origin in either Petra or in Yemen, but definitely not compatible with the present-day location of Mecca. Then there's the Quran itself. The Quran is supposed to be the eternal word of Allah, in existence from before the foundation of the earth, giving guidance to all people in all ages. Yet, when we take a close look, it appears it was written in the 7th century for 7th century people. For example, it repeatedly says, remember such and such, and then gives minimal details, or no details at all. It seems to expect the audience to already know the story. Which makes perfect sense, given that the evidence of the author or authors of the Quran were in fact repeating well-known stories, not personal revelation. The Quran itself contains the accusation that Muhammad was merely copying tales of the ancients several times. Likewise, Surah 16.103 contains an accusation that Muhammad has a human teacher and then gives the ridiculous defense that the teacher is of a foreign tongue. Apparently, the eternal word of Allah knew the specific person who people were going to say Muhammad was getting information from and had this defense ready for all of eternity. But the defense is idiotic. Human language can be translated. Furthermore, the defense states the Quran is pure Arabic, when in fact it contains many foreign loanwords. Modern Muslims will say the accusation of copying is false, that the Quran was correcting corrupted copies of previous revelation. Note first that the Quran itself contains no such claim. It merely asserts the accusers are wrong in most places, or, as we saw, makes lame and valid defenses. It seems Muslims know better than their God, but it gets worse. The Quran actually copies very little from the Bible, but instead copies from Midrash, Jewish commentaries on the scripture. And that's not all it copies. It also copies later legends such as the Seven Sleepers that were never considered scripture by anyone. It even borrows a pagan tale of Alexander the Great, named Dulcarnain in the Quran, where he travels to the ends of the earth 
and passes it off as fact. Which brings us to the many historical and scientific errors of the Quran. Remember, the Quran is supposed to be the literal speech of God, so it should be error-free. Instead, we find very little that's accurate. In the aforementioned tale of Dhul Karnain, the hero travels so far west that he comes to the place where the sun sets. What does he find? The sun sets in a muddy pool of water. Then he travels so far east that he comes to the place where the sun rises, and he finds a people without protection from the intense light. These descriptions only make sense if the earth is flat and the sun is much smaller than the earth. Speaking of a flat earth, the Quran states or implies just that many times. The sky, meanwhile, is apparently in a solid object that will fall on the people if Allah doesn't hold it up. This conception of the sky is supported by reference to invisible pillars. Likewise, the perfectly clear Quran strongly implies geocentrism. Stars are then tiny objects in the lowest heaven. Allah uses these stars as defensive missiles against jinn trying to sneak into heaven. When you see a shooting star, which is of course not actually a star, this is proof of the Quranic claim, at least according to its best interpreter, Muhammad. The Quran falsely claims sperm comes from between the backbone and the ribs. It claims human beings begin as a drop of blood. It claims all living things come in gendered pairs, having no knowledge of asexual reproduction. All animals live in communities, according to Allah, but sadly, that one's false as well. Allah confuses Mary, the sister of Aaron and Moses, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, two women who lived more than 1,000 years apart. Speaking of Mary, Allah seems to think Christians take her as part of the Trinity, and never once condemns the actual belief of the Christian Trinity. The Quran also claims Jesus prophesies the coming of Ahmed by name, but there is no evidence of that. The Quran claims Jews take Ezra as the Son of God in the same sense Christians take Jesus as the Son of God. But there's no solid evidence that anyone ever did that, let alone large groups of Jews. Allah also claims John the Baptist was the first person given that name, even though we know of many Johns before him. And what about the massive iron wall of Dulcarnain? It's supposed to exist until the Day of Judgment, yet it's nowhere to be found. There are many more scientific and historic errors in the Quran, but I think that's enough. Let's move on to internal contradictions. Muslims will, of course, try to find ways to resolve these. But remember, the Quran supposedly has only one author, God himself, who is perfectly clear and explains himself in detail. So elaborate explanations shouldn't be needed to explain all his differing claims. Where is Allah? The Quran gives multiple answers, and even Muslim scholars have been unable to solve the mystery, disagreeing strongly among themselves. Does Allah lead people astray, or not? Does Allah forgive all sins, or are some too grave for forgiveness? Can people bear the burdens of others, or only their own sins? How many days of creation were there? Six or eight? Or maybe it was just an instant. What was man created from? The Quran gives no less than six different answers. Who was the first Muslim? Muhammad? Moses? Abraham? Or maybe it was a group of Egyptians. Is alcohol permitted or forbidden? That last one, and some other contradictions on moral teaching, are solved by abrogation. The idea that Allah changed his commands over time sounds reasonable at first, 
at least if you imagine all of slowly bringing along 7th century people. But then you remember that this is supposedly his eternal speech, given multiple times to multiple different people groups, and the claim makes no sense at all. Which brings us to our last category, internal incoherence and logical errors of the Quran and Islamic beliefs. That's right, one need look no further than the Quran's own claims about itself for any rational person to say, I'm smarter than this Allah fella, but I'm no god, so he ain't neither. Speaking of abrogation, most Muslims don't realize it, but Hadith can, and often do, abrogate the Quran. That's right, Muhammad's words can overrule all his eternal word. But doesn't that make Muhammad a god? Even though the Quran asserts he's only a warner over and over again? Other times, Muslims simply forgot large portions of the Quran. But don't worry, that just means those verses were abrogated too. Indeed, even a tame sheep can abrogate verses when it eats the only copy of the text in question. The Quran repeatedly states or implies it is confirming the Torah and Gospels, and that if people were following them, they would follow Muhammad too. But even Muslims will agree the Bible and the Quran teach very different things, but that makes the Quran's claims false. To avoid this, Muslims claim that the Bible has been corrupted. This defies the historic evidence and also means they are supposedly smarter than the God who never once mentions said corruption explicitly. Similarly, the Quran states several times that Muhammad is found in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Sadly, the Quran doesn't cite any specifics, and so Muslims are left to guess where Muhammad is mentioned, and they haven't been able to come up with anything remotely convincing. Muslims believe Jesus was a Muslim prophet who attracted many Muslim followers. In the Quran, Allah promises that the true followers of Jesus will be superior over the unbelievers and remain that way until Judgment Day. However, the only followers of Jesus that have ever been superior in power or numbers are Christians. And Christians are definitely not Muslims. So either the Quran is wrong about who will become uppermost, or it is wrong about Jesus' followers being Muslims. Indeed, there's no evidence that Jesus ever had a single Muslim follower. Which brings us to the next problem. The Quran claims it sent a messenger to every nation. Yet 100% of the prophets before Muhammad that it knows about, unless we consider Alexander the Great a prophet, were sent to Israel. Furthermore, the verse says some in every nation are rightly guided by Allah. Yet, strangely, there's zero historic evidence of any messenger or any Muslim follower for any of the hundreds of nations that existed before Muhammad's time. The Quran's primary proof of its own inspiration is the Surah Like It challenge. Unbelievers are challenged to produce something like the Quran. Supposedly, when they realize they can't do it, they'll be impressed and know the Quran is from God. There are many problems with this, starting with the fact the author of the Quran can't make up his mind on how many like surahs are required. Is it one surah, ten surahs, or a whole book? Then there's the problem that no clear criteria are given. Indeed, even Muslim scholars disagree about whether the challenge refers to the supposed beauty of the rhetoric or unparalleled teaching. In Muhammad's day, multiple people claimed to meet or exceed the challenge, saying their own poetry was better. Satan apparently tricked Muhammad himself into thinking his words were the Quran in the Satanic Verses incident. Modern challengers, likewise, have sometimes fooled many Muslims. In contrast, I have never heard of a single person converted to Islam by the challenge. But most importantly, the challenge is simply invalid from the start. Even if the Quran is completely unique, that wouldn't make it from God. For such a claim to be true, every unique thing would have to come directly from God, which I don't think anyone would agree with. 
Then there is the Quran's other challenge. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran. If it had been from other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction. You do have to admire the confidence of Allah, leaving himself the escape hatch of much. Even ignoring that, Allah goofed up big time. Muslims tend to read the verse as if it said, if this contains much air, it is not from God. That statement would be all right, but it can only invalidate, not validate, the Quran, i.e. it is a negative challenge. That wasn't good enough for Allah, so he proposed a positive challenge instead. The problem is, it only works if it is always true that something without much air comes from God. That is obviously not true, meaning the verse itself is an error of logic, and the challenge is dead before it even begins. Ouch. So there you have it, a hundred reasons why Islam is false. I could go on, and I certainly left many things off the list, but I think that should be more than enough for any rational person to see Islam cannot possibly be true. So, what's it going to be, Muslims? Are you going to be rational adults and leave childish things behind? Or are you going to cling to the religion of your youth like Aisha clung to her dolls as the prophet brought her into her house so that he could have sex with her? Thanks for watching.